Hello, hello! In today's video, I'm going to teach you how to do this painting, which is quakies, aspen trees, birch trees, whatever you want to call them. I know this one's not finished yet, but I have about 10,000 things to tell you about how to do this painting, and it is so much fun, so stay tuned. Okay, for this painting, first things first, I saw this thumbnail on a video on YouTube. Actually, I just realized I never actually watched that video. So let me go watch that video real quick before we continue. But I have so many of these paintings and there's a good reason why that I will share with you shortly. <laughs> and the how to. Hang on, I gotta go watch that video and see what that turned out to be. Okay, wow, I went and watched that video and completely different method of doing this painting than I did and it was really, really cool. So I will link that in the corner and in the description box below so you can go watch that video too and then finish up here with this one. I did this painting as an example for my class in my intermediate watercolor that I teach at the local college and you can see, obviously, I'm not finished, but the cool thing was I did this example on Arches paper and I also used Canson paper and all kinds of stuff because I teach two classes so I had to demonstrate all of this twice and I'll show you how this is going to work out because that's really cool and I have yet another one and there's lots of reasons for this. Lots of aspen, birch, quickies, whatever you want to call them, coming up. One other really cool thing is one week after I did this with my class, Karen Rice on her YouTube channel released a video on how to paint birch trees. In fact, I haven't watched that one yet either and I probably need to go do that. I kind of like to just see a picture and be inspired by it, which is what I did by the thumbnail of that first video I talked about and paint it my way and then go watch the videos because we have such different methods and it's really cool. One thing that was similar between the first video and what I did was the use of salt. And I think you can see that here that we have some pretty cool effects with salt. And as long as your paint layer is pretty thick, the salt will come through as having color behind it. If your paint layer is pretty thin, it will pull the paint up and make white behind it, which I did see with a lot of my students' paintings. Well, not a lot of them, a few of my students' paintings pulled the paint up and just left white behind, which kind of looked more like snowflakes. So it was a little, uh, like, do we really want it to look like snowflakes? Sometimes, yes, like it could be white flowers if it were down here in this part of the trees, but I don't know, something to think about. So one drastic difference, well, all of the differences were drastic between the guy who actually did this painting in this thumbnail that inspired me and my painting was he used masking fluid for these trunks entirely, just masking fluid the whole time. And so you can use any kind of masking fluid, whether that is the PBO drawing gum here, or this is Windsor and Newton art masking fluid, whatever you want to do, that's fine. That's what he used. And he masked off all of his trunks and that takes a lot of time. So does the method that I chose to use, which is by using your masking tape. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you some clips of that right now, but while I am showing you clips of that on like one side of the video here, I'm gonna talk about the other side here because I do have one of these that is not quite finished with masking tape. And you can see when you put a full strip of masking tape down, you get this very straight edge along the side, okay? And I'll talk about this colorful masking tape here in a minute. But anyway, you cannot have a straight edge because trees are definitely not as straight as the edge of a piece of masking tape or painter's tape or artist tape or whatever you wanna call it. So when you do this, you'll see me in the video over here definitely ripping it. And then on these edges here, you put the ripped side out and you can see I did that right here on this one where it's overlapped, you see that? Okay, so it's overlapping that to get a not straight edge. <laughs> There's no better way to put that. So on this particular painting, I need to do that on this one here, this one, this one, this one, and this edge here. What you can do also is take your PBO drawing gum or your masking fluid, whichever brand you use, and take your applicator. I always use this silicone applicator, which I think is actually meant for clay. And I show this in the, did I show this in the video? I'm not sure if I show this over on the side, but 
you can take this along this edge and just by putting it along the edge you know us being imperfect humans and all if we just kind of do it quickly and without a whole lot of fanfare we can create an edge that is not straight that looks way more natural and so you don't have to keep ripping tape but as you're ripping tape for these other ones which you can see in the video that probably is still playing on the side because that took like a half an hour so the time lapse is going to be extremely long that as you rip tape you end up with some other edges that you can use that you can cover up some of these edges with so basically I ripped the tape into basically three pieces and was able to use all the pieces in different parts of masking these trunks off so it's really really handy when I do the masking tape method I do put it on my hands and try and get off some of the stickiness that is there because you don't want it to rip your paper afterwards now even with taking some of the sticky off depending on which paper you're using it may still try to rip when you take it off so using some heat when you take it off is handy and I'll get to that later too but anyway I basically kind of think of my tape as in thirds and just rip along trying to keep a relatively straight width because you can adjust the width as you place it on your paper okay now once you have gotten all of your straight edges not straight you do need to take some of your masking fluid in my opinion I guess you could still rip tape if you want to but you need to take some of this and do some of those really fine branches and the good thing is that these quakey trees birch trees whatever you want to call them they don't have a lot of branches but there are still a few so if you look at a painting that I did hang on so this one had several branches and other smaller trees masked off and where's the one that didn't over here this one didn't and granted I still have the tape on this one but the one with a few of the branches masked off looks way better way more realistic than the one without so you definitely want to grab a few of those and even just some random small little branch trees here would help so you'll go through and mask off some of those and this is where getting a reference photo is probably pretty darn helpful because you don't want to overdo it and you don't want to underdo it you just want it just a few a few here and there because some of the branches are going to be dark so you don't need to do all of the branches you see so if you look in this thumbnail that I printed out here we do have a lot of light colored branches but look how many are dark quite a few of these are dark so you don't need to worry about those until after you've painted the entire painting but definitely mask off some of them okay now that you have a few extra branches and some smaller trees masked off you are ready to do the background but there's some very important things I need to tell you about this particular background this one was done on arches 100% cotton cold pressed watercolor paper I used my core watercolors for this you'll notice that I have full pans which means I can put a lot of water and get a really creamy mixture in these pans and I can also pull out extra mixing space like the lid of this tin if I need to to get an even creamier watercolor consistency so if you don't have full pans I would suggest maybe using your paint straight from the tube to do what I'm going to do you need lots of watercolor in a really creamy consistency the colors I used basically were all of the all of these <laughs> all of these and then sap green mixed with sometimes a little viridian green and sometimes a little bit of this green gold but mostly these fall colors okay so that is cadmium yellow primrose nickel azo yellow which I didn't use very much of diarolide yellow quinacridone gold transparent pyrrole orange is so gorgeous that's one you definitely need I didn't use permanent scarlet I find that to be a little opaque and I don't really like it all that well for certain things the cadmium red medium was great I think that's it I think I went only as far as the cadmium red medium and then I went over to the greens sap green green gold a little bit of rooting kind of so when you're using arches cold press 100% cotton watercolor paper can we say that even more <laughs> I was able to put wet paint on dry paper and I will show you how to do this background so don't worry but there's some really important things I have to tell you first because wet paint dry paper and because I was using really high quality paper I was able to do that and then use the salt 
and get these beautiful salt effects before my paint dried. And then I went and demonstrated this to my class on Canton XL paper. So this is just, hang on, I'll find it. It's right here, right here. This stuff, all right. And I did the same method, the same watercolor paint, same core colors, and it obviously is completely different paper. So I could not do the salt effect on this because I used wet paint again on dry paper and it was immediately dry, way too dry to even try to use salt on that. So then, <laughs> just because I'm a curious kind of person, I did it again on Canson XL paper, but I wet the entire background. So I had it all masked off just like this one, wet the entire background, and then used my core paints. This is again Canson XL paper, and then it stayed wet enough for me to use salt and get these beautiful salt effects. So your paper choice is gonna determine whether you're going to do wet on dry or wet on wet. So the one I have masked off for you guys is again Arches 140 pound cold press paper. Now I can do wet on dry and get away with it and use the salt for these beautiful effects. But if you're a little worried about how fast you can work, then definitely wet your whole paper first, regardless of the quality of paper you're using. Okay, if you remember in the first demonstration with the Arches paper, I told you that I used wet on dry, but since I'm filming and sometimes that takes longer, I am going to go ahead and wet this paper because I definitely want that salt effect. I think it adds a whole lot to the composition in general. So I'm just taking my hockey brush. No idea where or when I got it, but I got it and I'll tell you about that piece anyway. It has paint on it, it's bleeding into the background. I don't care because it's the same colors as I've used in all of these. Now this is a cardboard backing, so it you shouldn't get water on the outside. It doesn't work very well, but all my other backings are a little busy. I did put water in these to kind of pre-wet them, make them even juicier. I am getting pretty low on this cadmium yellow primrose. I'm going to have to replace that at some point. But again, these are my core paints and you just want a lot of pigment. Because I pre-wet this, it's going to dry, of course, even lighter. Grab even more water. And you can mix all the colors that I'm using here together. So you don't even have to worry about one bleeding into the other and creating mud. So the next one I'm going to use, uh, where's my little cheater sheet here? I can use the Nicolazzo yellow, but I think I'm gonna go into the Diarolide yellow. I can never say that very well, but tis what it is. So if you've paused and watched those other videos, you can see this is quite a different technique than the thumbnail that I originally even got the idea from, which is so fun. How fun is that? And then while I had you guys paused, <laughs> I went ahead and watched Karen Rice's video and hers was, again, completely different than mine, so really cool to get the different effects. So I'm going to do the transparent pyrrole orange next. This is such a gorgeous color. Look at this. Oh, oh my gosh. Don't you just, don't you just love that? It's amazing. Everyone should have this color on their palette. It's so darn Pretty. And look how it's fingering into that. I love that. I'm going to try and not mess that up. I'm going to grab some nickel azo yellow or wait, nope, quin gold, sorry. This is more of a brown, so it's great for fall colors here. Grab some of this. Some of my paper is drying a little bit already. No big deal. Just need to make sure I get in here before too much dries. And then we get into the reds. <laughs> I'm going to use cadmium red medium and just kind of barely put some in here and there. It's a very strong color and I have a ton of pigment on my brush right now, so to be really careful with that one. I'm going to grab some more yellow. Try not to mess up that beautiful fingering I have going on in a few places. And I can definitely get some more of that back when I add some of the salt, some more of the transparent pyrrole orange. And then real quick, going into the sap green. Okay, I touched the red, so I'm gonna have a little more brown going on there, and that is A-okay with me. I do not mind. So that's pretty dry up there. 
getting into some pretty dry areas. I actually, okay, I touched a little bit of the green gold, but I don't really feel like I need a whole lot of that. This is a very fall scene. I'm gonna put a little more dark green down here to counter the dark red I have going up there. I'm trying to cover most of the paper. It doesn't matter if you miss a little bit, that's okay. And then, salt, I had it open and ready. Doesn't really matter what kind of salt you use. Some of this is already too dry, the salt won't even work. And some of it will look great. It's a dry day, I have a wood stove fire going in my house right now back there. That's probably that background noise you can hear. All of that affects the drying time. And that is one big reason why I decided to go ahead and do this with a wet on wet technique, even though it's good paper. We're gonna let that dry and then I'll be back with you guys. Actually, I kinda wanna try something different. I'm gonna lift the paper and kinda let things bleed down. Lift it this way, let things bleed down that way. Do something different. This isn't quite as deep as I like, so mm, I'm gonna take some Nicolazzo yellow, sprinkle in there. I have to be careful. Like if I touch the salt, it's obviously gonna get on my brush and spread around, so I'm trying to avoid this, the areas where I have a lot of salt, but Sprinkling that in here and there. I think that will be quite pretty. Okay, now I'm gonna leave it alone. Right, moving on. If you wondered why, on, so this is the one I left you guys with and it's dry and I just brushed the salt off. That took way too long to dry, by the way. If I don't go get my heat gun out of my scrapbooking cabinet this weekend, I am going to go insane. So that's my life goal this weekend, to go get the heat gun. Am I going to go buy a blow dryer? Probably not, I should, but I think a heat gun will work. But anyway, if you saw, when I was showing you, I have this side. Uh, this tape already has color on it and you may wonder what the heck was going on with that. Well, I'm gonna show you. So as you take the tape off of this side and you have a complete trunk of a tree here, it's really cool because it all stays together if you're careful. Okay, so the whole trunk can peel off in one piece and then you grab a brand new piece of watercolor paper and you stick it on there in a different place so that you have a slightly different composition. Sleeve, push down, that's very important. And you'll end up pulling all of this tape off and you can end up with a brand new painting that is fully masked off, trees ready to go, and you can do completely different background. So on this one, this is on an Arches 8x10 block, I think. And I want to do a darker colored background. One of my students did that and it was gorgeous. So I'm going to try that with this one. So I have five of these Aspen tree paintings between all of these. So this one, I am not going to actually save the tape for. I probably could, should, whatever. I could sell it on Etsy. I have no idea how to sell things, but anyway, I probably could, and it does seem like a waste to not use this tape. Oh gosh, maybe I will. I don't know, I don't know. But that's how you can have multiple paintings of this with the same amount of work. It's so nice, it just, it's so easy. So yes, pull all your tape off. You'll also wanna pull your masking fluid off, and that's really cool because it leaves these beautiful white areas, just some rolled up tape that I always leave over on the side of my desk. And it does work better to take this masking tape, or the, sorry, the masking fluid off once your tape is removed, because it does kind of stick to the sides of the tape. But I just wanted to show you what an example of this will look like when you have removed the masking fluid. It's so cool. So definitely do the masking fluid and the tape. So I will get all the rest of this off and show you the results in a second. Okay, here is what the one that I've been doing with you guys looks like, but cheating for a second and pulling out the one I started in class, I wanted to show you the trunks because you need to decide which direction the light is coming from. In this particular painting, the light will be coming from the right side and so we need to definitely shadow the left side. Plus we need to have a light midtone and dark value so that we show roundness. Now if the light were coming from the front of this, I would have dark on both sides and the light strip would be down the middle. So I may try something slightly different on the one that I'm doing with you guys, but the concept is the same. Decide where the light is coming from and then make dark shadows and then Birch trees, quakies, okay, so where I grew up, we just called them aspens or quakies, whether that's right, wrong, or whatever. They have these little dark spots, knots, I guess, if you will. So you need to make sure you get those in without them looking like 
Dalmatians. <laughs> and I only laugh because one of my students and I, uh, she ended up with some trees that were very spotted and we got a kind of a kick out of it. But anyway, you need to keep these more organic looking. And I think that looking up some references for these trees is probably the best bet when you're doing these darker spots. Anyway, let's go ahead and do that. And I just used dark colors on my palette, but I did in this one put in a lot of purple slash blue. And then there are some darker colors here. So just whatever leftovers I have is great. And then the mid-tone for this one, I used, I think, the raw sienna a little bit with a little bit of green, actually. So you can see I put that puddle in where my green is a little bit. And so you just gotta decide what you're gonna do. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a dark mid-tone and light value. And I did wet the entire trunk first. I got a little water where it shouldn't be, but wet the entire trunk first. You don't have to be totally exact about this. And I'm using the dirty water from doing the background. So it's just slightly tinted orange. So no big deal. Go ahead and wet the entire trunk. I like to do that because it gives a soft bleed when you do your values. On this particular one, since I'm already doing this one with the light coming from the right, I think I may, maybe we'll do the light coming from the front because I think it would be kind of fun to try and have dark on each side of this tree. I'm just gonna mix these dark colors on my palette, which I do really enjoy, whatever they are. And it's probably not dark enough. I tend to go too light at first. Just bring down that side. Yep, that's way too light. Bring down this side. I wanna do that without outlining it. So then I'm gonna mix more of this random dark stuff on my palette, get some really cool colors going. Love that, whatever that is. That actually has a little bit of red in it, which is kinda of neat. Get some more of that. Make it slightly darker on one side just to indicate that maybe the light is slightly bent from one side to the other. Get even more dry pigment over here on the palette and go in even darker. And this one doesn't have a lot of purple in it. I just washed my brush and I'm dipping into a little bit more of the purple on my palette. A little bit more of that. Maybe some of this color. Kind of start to get that in there and then rinse my brush and get a soft blend for maybe a mid-tone. Definitely need to go darker. I'm trying to decide, I think maybe my, what is that? I think it's sepia, neutral tint. My neutral tint might be a good option. To go a little darker. Need more water to activate that. Neutral tint with a little, whoa! That dioxazine purple, like, whew, that activated. Okay, well, cool. We will grab some more neutral tint to neutralize <laughs> that. But I think coming in with that even more so, oh yeah, that's so pretty. And because I'm using core paints, it fingers out like that and it's gorgeous. Do a little bit here, get a little darker on the bottom maybe. And if I want to warm this up, maybe a little bit of that raw sienna again over here. And I wanna be careful. I'm at the point where I have a pretty watery mixture. I could create some blooms, but I do wanna warm it up. So I'm just dabbing that in, do love that. I think that worked really well. And then you'll want to grab your really dark color and do the dots. Now this is now pretty wet from that raw sienna mixture I put on there. So I have to decide if I'm okay with that or what. Payne's Gray is a good choice for really dark ones here. Um, I put a little Payne's Gray on my palette. I'm just mixing that in. My brush is kind of big for this. So I should probably get a smaller brush. I'm actually gonna grab some of the raw umber to mix in with it and then do a couple of those knots. Now, since this is wet, it's really going to blend in. And that's okay. Some of these knots are on the edges, so don't forget about that. I'm gonna grab even darker pigment. I have a hair on that that actually worked perfectly to pull it across and do one of those little birch tree lines. You wanna make these, yeah, very spontaneous. Not, not obvious, not symmetrical, not spotted, nothing like that. And like where this branch comes in, I haven't painted that branch yet, but sometimes there's darkness on these birch trees around where that branch would come in. So it's good to think about those things. I would just continue that for every single trunk. I know this is a long tutorial, but you just keep going and then when it's all painted, you will pull in some dark branches in the background. We're gonna grab some of this 
neutral tint color. Mix it in our Payne's Gray Puddle, basically, and pull in some of that purple, why not? You do have some dark branches back there that attach to some of your bushes or things like that, so you wanna make sure that you're including those. All right, so you get the idea from there. You just repeat all these trees over and over. And then once it dries, like this one is, sometimes, in my opinion, you'll probably want to take a brush and do some leaves over the top. You can grab a mixture of your colors that you enjoyed using for the background. Just kind of pull some leaves over and just need to make sure they kind of match what's going on in your background. So I may do some more bright yellow, like here. Branches here that maybe some leaves would be attached to. Some branches here, perhaps. And just kind of bring those in, make them look correct. And that would be your very last step. So down here we have some darker ones again. Some of these, maybe there's some leaves on. And if you think that it looks strange or whatever, you can take your darker branch color and kind of put in one of those darker branches on this particular painting. I don't have the darker branches painted in, so having that come in here would be a good addition to making some of this look more natural. And I will just keep going on all of that and paint these to completion. I will not paint them to completion on this video, or you wouldn't have a video today, because I'm out of time. But that's how it'll go, and it'll look so pretty when you're done. Actually, before I do let you go, I want to do the background on this one in that darker tone that I told you about. Here is the dark one with the salt brushed off and the tape taken off, and I didn't wait for it to completely dry, so when I brushed the salt off, of course, it streaked down in my trunks, but that's not a big deal. That will be fine, just fine, sure. But if you are as disappointed as I am in not seeing these all finished in this video, hit the thumbs up button, because I will show these to you in some later videos, probably on Tuesday's video. So subscribe down below, hit the bell for all notifications, because the ladies and I have a get together this Saturday and I will make it my mission to try and finish as many of these crazy five <laughs> Aspen tree paintings as I can this Saturday. So wow and holy cow. But anyway, lots of work to do. You can see, how, wait, wait, wait. You can see how to do it. It's going to look really awesome when it's finished. So again, Subscribe down below to see the finished product, hopefully on Tuesday. Fingers crossed. Okay, that was really fun. Bye for now. See you in the next video. Wait, I should say, see you in the next video. Bye for now.